Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching The School of Battle, Frederick the Great Part 2 by Extra History. So, last time we saw the tough childhood of Frederick the Great, all of the mistreatment he endured from his father, but we ended the episode with Frederick gaining a little bit more independence, getting ready to live his own life. And that's where we're starting off this one. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon and channel memberships, both of which you can find down below, and both of which will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. The Rhine, April 1734. Mm. It's the War of Polish Succession, and Frederick, Crown Prince of Prussia, is trying to be the man his father wants him to be. Yeah, and we talked about this last time. This is sort of the ironic thing about Frederick's upbringing. You know, his father wanted him to be this austere military man, just like he was. And he was so angry at his son, Frederick the Great, for some of his personality traits. His love for literature and the arts, his sexuality. But Frederick the Great would grow up to be one of Prussia's greatest warrior kings. I mean, he would become a leader his father could be proud of. But his father just couldn't get over some of these other qualities which they so strongly disagreed over. Uh, also, we're jumping into the War of Polish Succession. You know, if you want to get an idea of how many wars occurred during the 18th century, you just need to look at some of the wars of succession of that era. You know, Spanish, Polish, Austrian, Bavarian, all these different wars of succession. Really, when they had a diplomatic problem in the 18th century, everyone just went straight to war, fighting each other. That will change a bit following the Napoleonic Wars, but gives you a good idea of sort of the era we're in right now. Though court-martialed after his attempted escape to England, he's been restored to military rank in order to gain battlefield experience. But this is not how you run an army. Frederick is embedded with the forces of the Holy Roman Empire, confronting the French under the famed general, Prince Eugene of Savoy. Yet Eugene is a fated hero. He can pass wisdom and experience to Frederick, sure, but he's also 70, frail, and can barely remember his last conversation. Yeah, Prince Eugene, like they said, I think someone who could pass a lot of wisdom and knowledge on to Frederick, but someone who, at this point, his time is already gone. <laughs> you know, he was brilliant, but that was before this era. You know, during Frederick's youth, probably even before Frederick was born. At this point, Frederick is a young man. He's out there in the field. Eugene's a bit past his prime. He's cautious and defensive, afraid to act. His body was still there, Frederick later observed, but mm. his soul had gone. And yeah. the Imperial Army, well, it was weak, disorganized, and fractious. I could defeat this enemy, Frederick muses, and he would get his chance. I mean, yeah, Frederick leading the unified, disciplined, and professionalized Prussian army would absolutely be a more formidable foe than the Imperial Army here. For this terrorized prince was about to start a fire that would burn through Europe and the world. Say, would you happen to want to watch the next episode of this series immediately after watching this one instead of having to wait a full week? Well, now with the new Nebula first, you totally can. Learn how to get access through the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle after the episode. At the end of last week's episode, Frederick decided to play the role of the dutiful son. And, you know, wait until his ill father died. <laughs> he submitted to a new regime of tutors that focused on making him masculine, agreed to marry a woman he detested, and went to war. But a strange thing happened. Frederick actually became a pretty good soldier. Yeah, I, I think I emphasized this last episode, but <laughs> despite the differences between Frederick II, Frederick the Great, and his father, Frederick William, you know, Frederick II was intelligent, talented, and he really took to this sort of thing. It was just that his father didn't like how, you know, effeminate Frederick was, at least in his view. He didn't like Frederick's interests, his personality, his sexuality. And by the way, these are all things that Frederick the Great would hold on to throughout his life. He wouldn't change. You know, he would stay the way he was. But alongside all of those things, he was also a talented military man. And he would learn quickly. So, you know, it just is this sort of funny situation where 
His father, you know, can't manage to beat his personality out of him. But despite that, despite the terrible treatment, <laughs> Frederick the Great lives up to be the kind of character that his father might have wanted. As colonel of a regiment, he developed a fascination with strategy, battlefield tactics, and leadership. And while he never truly saw any action during the War of Polish Succession, he acquitted himself honorably. When he mm. returned, his father, Frederick William, now confined to a wheelchair by gout, reconciled with his son. Proud of Frederick's progress, he gave him a lakeside castle. Yeah, and to my understanding, later in the life of Frederick William I, he and his son would reconcile because Frederick William was finally seeing the sort of progress from his son that he had wanted, which I think Frederick the Great was always capable of. And, you know, young Fritz, young Frederick, while, I mean, we don't know exactly what he thought, we can't see inside his head, I don't imagine he ever forgave his father for some of the horrible abuse he experienced, but I do know that he did come to respect his father's accomplishments. I mean, Frederick the Great very well recognized that a lot of the work he did in his reign was building upon what his father had laid out before him. He knew that. So, you know, not saying their relationship became fantastic and now it was, you know, this loving father-son bond. Absolutely not. But they did sort of come to an understanding and they had a better relationship than they had throughout Frederick's youth where he could indulge in artistic pursuits in private. Frederick and his wife, Elizabeth Christine, moved in. Though in truth, he largely kept clear of her. <laughs> there, yeah. he read books, staged plays with friends, played the flute, set up a regular discussion group on military strategy, and recruited architects to expand his new home. It mm -hmm. was the happiest time of his life. Though he was clandestinely doing something else as well, preparing to become king. See, mm. some of those architects started quietly taking trips on his dime, studying opera houses in Italy and France. He also immersed himself in philosophical writing, producing his first book, The Anti-Machiavel, an idealistic yep. refusion of Machiavelli's The Prince. Yes, and so, on Machiavelli's The Prince, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but it was uh, this book that was written as sort of a guide to princes, kings, leaders of states, on how to best lead. And it was a very ends justify the means, real politics sort of work. Uh, there's this famous quote that, uh, not exactly, but basically says that, you know, it's better to be both loved and feared, but if you can only be one, it is better to be feared. Uh, and this book had become very popular throughout Europe, and in fact, a lot of monarchs, princes, leaders throughout Europe had really taken notes from Machiavelli's book. Now, a quick aside, there is some chatter uh, amongst academics uh, and, honestly, people going back hundreds of years who believe that The Prince was actually written by Machiavelli as more of a satire or a bit of deceit, as in he didn't actually mean what he was writing, he was trying to expose the brutal ways of monarchical leadership, or he was, you know, writing a satire, making fun of it. Because, for those that don't know, Machiavelli was actually a Republican. Uh, and he was a Republican in an era when that was still rather unpopular. Uh, he was very much into classical Republicanism, ancient Rome, ancient Greek. And so, obviously, <laughs> what he wrote in The Prince doesn't really match up with his ideology, his beliefs. I don't necessarily think The Prince was written as a satire. Uh, I think, you know, Machiavelli was a Republican, but I think The Prince was more a sort of non-ideological, practical guide to ruling. Uh, it may not be how Machiavelli wanted states to be run. I think it was more a recognition of the current situation uh, and him, like I said, attempting to write this pragmatic guide. But I could be wrong. It very well could be a satire. There's a lot of debate over this. I'm curious to see uh, what you guys think of that. Um, so that is the context around Machiavelli's The Prince, and now we get to Frederick's response. In the book, Frederick argues in favor of an enlightened absolutist monarch who would yep. provide a moral example to his people and keep them healthy and happy. He then sent them... 
Yes, so Frederick very much taking cues from the Enlightenment. Uh, he took a lot of cues from Voltaire, who we're seeing on the screen right now. He tried to refute Machiavelli's The Prince. He felt that a ruler should rule for the benefit of their people. Frederick had this idea, rather novel at the time, that the king was not necessarily some absolute monarch chosen by God, but that the king was meant to be the first servant of the people. This was still a pretty crazy idea. He didn't come up with it, necessarily. It was based on social contract theory that had come before him. But it was pretty unusual for someone of Frederick's stature to be writing about these kind of things. The manuscript to the French philosopher Voltaire, who edited it and prepared it for anonymous publication. Though his <laughs> identity did leak immediately. Yes, anonymous in quotation marks. A lot of books were published anonymously at this point. A lot of these enlightened philosophy books because the writers were worried that uh, if they put their name on it, they would be ar arrested by their home government. Some countries were more lenient than others. But also, a lot of these books published anonymously, it wasn't really anonymous. Everybody in the know understood who had actually written it. Like, oh, this says anonymous. Yeah, everybody knows that Voltaire wrote this. Or anonymous. Yeah, this is actually the work of King Frederick II, you know, of Prussia. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why it was so popular. It was kind of, a, like I said, a crazy thing to see. It would eventually become a bestseller with readers hoping to gain a window into Frederick's mind. And mm. perhaps the greatest insights could be found in a section on the type of wars he considered just. It mm. contains some of the things you'd expect, such as defensive wars or wars of last resort, but also what Frederick called wars of interest. Yep. In such a war, a king realizes an enemy is going to declare war on him in the future and preemptively attacks them in order to gain the greatest military advantage. So this is what we would call a preemptive strike. Uh, controversial then, controversial now. And this gives us a look at sort of the other side of Frederick's philosophy. You know, Frederick was, uh, on one hand, this humane, philosophizing, enlightened king. On the other hand, he was, frankly, a warmongerer. You know, he started <laughs> uh, wars to benefit his kingdom, which got a lot of people killed. Now, some people, including myself, think there's a bit of a contradiction there <laughs> between these two sides. But others, including Frederick himself, as we're seeing here, he didn't see that contradiction. He felt that all sides of his ideology the domestic policy, the philosophy, the arts, the war-making, the diplomacy, it all came together under one singular worldview. So there are different ways to look at it, and I think this is one of the things that makes Frederick such a fascinating character. And this is something that would also characterize other enlightened despots of the era, and I think partially because they were following in Frederick's footsteps. A lot of these enlightened monarchs, Catherine the Great is a good example, they followed the works of the Enlightenment. They had this, quote-unquote, progressive domestic policy. But they were also aggressive conquerors, seizing a lot of territory and waging a lot of wars. It's really interesting dynamic, I think. Huh. Was Frederick already considering the moves he'd make during his reign? Well, it's possible. Surely. Though by this time, he had become adept at keeping people at a distance, hiding behind a series of masks and personas that sometimes contradicted one another. And more mm. often than not, he adopted the part of a misanthropic loner. Some historians see this as a survival tactic. A I think it can be tough to work out what is actually going on with any historical figure, but particularly someone like Frederick, who was a little more guarded. You know, he was good at presenting an image um, to everybody, to the whole of Europe. He presented an image of the enlightened philosopher king. And everybody bought it hook, line, and sinker. And now there was a lot of truth to that image, but of course, as of any image, it's partially manufactured. What was actually going on underneath, beneath the mask, it's very hard to tell, right? I mean, we can't really know. Only Frederick himself would have known. Um, not to mention that people in many ways are sort of inherently contradictory. <laughs> so I'm sure uh, Frederick in his own head contradicted himself. So, you know, it, it's tough. A response to trauma and an attempt to hide his sexuality. But it did mean that even for close friends and ministers, it was really difficult to get inside Frederick's head. 
so yeah. it's hard to say exactly how Frederick felt in May of 1740 when he got word that his father was dying. Mm -hmm. Rushing to the palace in Berlin, they had time for one last talk. And it turned out that while opposite on all else, their political ambitions aligned. Yes. And this is like what I was saying earlier. It's not like they came together and now had a loving relationship. That's not what happened. Um, I'm sure Frederick William was still unhappy with some aspects of his son's personality, and I'm sure Frederick the Great could not forgive his father for some of the things he did to him. But they had the same goal. They wanted to expand Prussia's power, expand Prussia's territory, a goal that they would both pursue. And Frederick II would build upon the work his father had already done. So that united goal, I do think, brought them together at the end of Frederick William's life. Both dreamed of uniting the scattered territories of Brandenburg, Prussia. Yes, and if we look at the map here, and we looked at this last time, we have, you know, Prussia, Brandenburg, and then a couple of islands of territory out to the west. And correctly so, Extra History has highlighted this territory, part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as territory to be gained. This Polish corridor is the territory that Frederick and his father most wanted to take. They wanted to connect the two largest and most powerful chunks of their territory for, I think, clear reason, right? Currently sprinkled through the Holy Roman Empire or embedded with Poland, and both thought their kingdom could be one of the great nations of Europe. Then, on And they were already on the way to doing this. I don't know if we'll get more into it. I don't think so. At the beginning of this episode, we started with the War of Polish Succession. Now, at one point, decades ago, Poland-Lithuania had been one of the great powers of the region. At this point, it was in a sort of terminal decline, and the War of Polish Succession had really uh, eliminated a lot of Polish autonomy. It was really falling under the control of its neighbors, and by the time the 18th century was over, Poland as a state would no longer exist. Its territory would be eaten up by all of its powerful neighbors. So you, I mean, I'm sure the cogs are already turning, right? Well, Prussia needs this territory, which Poland currently has. Poland is on the decline, you know, put two and two together, and hopefully we can unite our kingdom. And Frederick was very much thinking that too, as we will see throughout the rest of his reign. On March 31st, 1740, Frederick William died in the arms of the son he tormented. But yeah. Frederick wasn't left alone. For now, he had the most efficient bureaucracy in Europe, an unmatched recruitment system, an army of 80,000, and an enormous war yep. chest of funds. All things his father had left to him. An amount his father had amassed by avoiding foreign wars. Mm -hmm. The soldier king had, ironically, relied chiefly on clever diplomacy and never fully used the army he'd built. Yeah, and once again, it, it, it's kind of funny... You have the austere soldier king, Frederick William I, who primarily used diplomacy to expand his territory and the power of his country, even though he built up this incredibly powerful army. His son, Frederick the Great, he will take that army that his father had built and take the resources his father had amassed, and he would put them to work. Frederick would... He was incredibly skilled at diplomacy as well, but he would use warfare as a tool of expansion far more than his father had. King Frederick II, however, would. But yep. first, some fun. Frederick's immediate move after his father's death was to build an opera house. He wanted to invest in the arts and sciences, which, ironically enough, his father had defunded so badly <laughs> that they actually had to borrow soloists from Saxony to sing at his funeral. <laughs> Next wow. up, no longer requiring a wife to mollify his father, Frederick sent poor Elizabeth Christine to a palace outside Berlin. Yes, and I believe I mentioned this last time, but as soon as his father was gone, it's not like Frederick was spending a lot of time with his wife while his father was alive, but once he was dead, Elizabeth Christine was sent to a palace where I'm sure she lived a nice life, but where she did not see her husband. He lived separately, and to him... This marriage was just one of his duties as the sovereign of Prussia. He would visit his wife on special occasions. <laughs> That's what it was to him. It was not a relationship. It wasn't even really a friendship. It was something that he had to attend to occasionally. She wasn't even invited to his coronation. 
Instead, he brought an Italian philosopher who was likely his lover, and the pair followed it up with a foreign trip together where they met Voltaire. Then. And what a what a unique relationship. You have the archetypical enlightened despot. The guy that a lot of enlightened monarchs would base their reigns off of, Frederick. And then you have probably the most famous and influential enlightenment philosopher, Voltaire. Once again, someone who a lot of philosophers who came after would base their ideas and career off of. These two extremely important figures coming together and having this intellectual and personal relationship. I mean, what a meeting of personalities. With all of that out of the way, Frederick prepared for a war of interest. October 20th, 1740, Vienna. Charles VI, Holy Roman Emperor and Sovereign of the Habsburg Dominions, is dead. All yep. his life, Charles had been terrified that he would only have daughters, and because the laws of the Habsburg Dominions said women could not inherit, his scattered territories would fragment in a succession crisis when he died. And a succession crisis was a concern for any monarch at this time, but particularly for the Habsburgs. Now, when we talk about Habsburg territory, sometimes people just use shorthand and call it Austria. Sometimes they call it the Habsburg lands, which is more accurate because Habsburg territory was extremely split, more than most other monarchs. Now, at this point, a lot of European powers were not that centralized or unified, but the Habsburgs in particular had a problem. <laughs> a lot of their territory was got through diplomacy, marriages, titles granted, leadership positions, and so their territory was this mishmash of disunited uh, land. You know, you had Austria, Silesia, a lot of different territory, and if they had a succession crisis, they risked the entire thing falling apart. I mean, you can see earlier, at the beginning of the video, I listed all the succession crises, or some of the succession crises of this century, it was clearly a big deal in the first place, but particularly for Austria, it was a problem. To prevent this, he issued the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713, declaring that a woman could inherit the Habsburg lands, and he spent most of his reign trying to get his neighbors to agree to it. Yep, he tried his best, but... Good thing, too, since his daughter, Maria Theresa, proved his most viable heir. Ironically, a woman Frederick tried to marry when he was searching for a bride. Hmm. Now, that'd be an alternate history novel worth reading. It Charles would. had essentially bankrupted Austria in trying to bribe the great states into accepting the pragmatic saying. I think we're getting to that, but <laughs> Charles VI had spent a lot of his time trying to ensure that he would not have a succession crisis, crisis that Maria Theresa could take over where he left off. A document they immediately backed off of yep. as soon as he was dead. Exactly. Austria's military was also weakened from a series of major wars, meaning the vultures were circling. Yep, and that's how it was at this time. We're talking about an era of realpolitik. Everyone's out for themselves, and unlike the era following the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress of Vienna, where it was... A little more peaceful, there was still certainly war, but diplomacy was far more an important option. These European powers were willing to get together, hash it out, and ideally not go to war. Uh, though there certainly would be wars, of course, following the uh, years following the Napoleonic Wars. But, when we're talking about the 18th century, that system was still in its infancy and didn't really exist. And so, when a power like Austria was weakened all of her neighbors would jump on top. And so this is just an opportunity for them to attack. Charles tried his best <laughs> to ensure that Maria Theresa would have no problem taking over. Unfortunately, his neighbors, like Prussia, for example, would not accept her rule as sovereign of Austria. They would challenge it, and they would go to war. Seeing what they could pick off the Habsburg corpse. Of course, Austria also had something Frederick wanted. Yep. Silesia. Silesia. Uh, pretty important territory, often fought over, I'll put it that way. A province that made up a third of Austrian revenue and sat right across the border from Brandenburg. But Frederick needed to make his move soon, way too long, and Saxony might take Silesia first, blocking Prussian expansion south. Yep. In six weeks, lightning speed in 18th century standards, Frederick had mobilized his army and crossed the border into Silesia. It was so easy at first, so much so 
that he could not have imagined that this act would set in motion a chain of events that would bring bloodshed not just to Central Europe, but yep. to places as far away as Senegal, Brazil, India, and the Philippines. Yeah, I am very much sure that despite the fact that Frederick was an intelligent guy, when he started this war, he never could have imagined how the War of Austrian Succession would balloon into this massive conflict between these great powers. Uh, it's interesting, we have the War of Austrian Succession, and then, uh, only a few years later, we had the Seven Years' War, which is similar in some aspects, and it was frankly even more global. Uh, and it was global because this is a war between the European great powers, but at this point, the European great powers are also established colonial powers. So when fighting goes on in Europe, fighting also goes on in the colonies. Um, I mean, I mentioned the Seven Years' War. With the Seven Years' War, you have the American theater of the war, which in America we call the French and Indian War. That was a rather important theater of that war. So it's interesting to see, you know, in the 20th century, we have the two world wars. But there are some who claim that something like the Seven Years' War was really the first quote-unquote world war. Or if you want to use a less loaded term, the first global conflict between these powers. Uh, and of course, the world wars were on a completely different scale. The intent isn't to compare them, just to show that even at this point, um, the globe was very much affected by the goings-on of the Western great powers. The First Silesian War and the War of Austrian Succession had begun. Yeah. Prussian forces were practically unopposed, sweeping up the lightly defended province and taking forts. But Maria Theresa, who would become Frederick's lifelong rival, mm -hmm. raised an army and began to oppose him. And it's interesting, you know, Maria Theresa, she is not the dynamic philosopher monarch that Frederick was. He was, and I use the word progressive, progressive is not a word they would have used at the time, but it gives the idea, you know, forward moving. She was not the progressive style monarch that Frederick was. She was a very traditional conservative Catholic. But Maria Theresa was also very capable. And she was someone who recognized when reform was needed. She was willing to change when she felt it was necessary. So while very different from Frederick the Great, I think in many ways she is a fitting rival. And so, Frederick II fought in his first battle. Mulwitz, April 10th, 1741. Mm. As the Austrian cavalry comes at his right flank, Frederick realizes his mistake. He would tried to run this battle like an exercise, like he was drilling troops. When they'd come upon the Austrians, they could have simply charged into the smaller, unready army. But instead, he'd formed up, putting his grenadiers between mm. his cavalry, like the great Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus did huh. in the Thirty Years' War. And for those that are unfamiliar, as they mentioned, Gustavus Adolphus was a Swedish king who had led Swedish forces, uh, and I believe other forces, uh, in the Thirty Years' War, this gigantic uh, European war of religion uh, in the previous century. He was a very impressive military leader, and I'm sure a lot of those who followed would take cues from him. Um, this was an era in which Sweden was actually a pretty important European power, I think partially due to the actions of Gustavus Adolphus. So, as they're pointing out, he absolutely would have been someone who Frederick would study in the history books. A formation that would let the infantry murder cavalry with shots before his own mounted troops could countercharge. A battle plan out of a history book right. isn't working. Right. But, <laughs> you know, just because something worked in the history books does not mean that it's going to work again in real life. You know, there's the, the rather famous saying that no plan survives contact with the enemy, which I believe we might be about to see here. You can have the most intelligent, well-planned out uh, plan, right? But once you actually get into the battle it might just fall apart, and you're going to have to make some on-the-fly decisions. Instead, the Austrian horse crashes into the right wing of his army and envelops it. His cavalry are standing still when the charge connects. The units mix in a battle of swords and pistols, and Frederick's in the thick of the fighting. It's confused and bloody. There's Whoa. driving snow and fog, 
and both sides have white uniforms. The Jeez. Prussian infantry and artillery keeps firing into their own ranks, mistaking comrades for the enemy, and the mm. Prussian cavalry are starting to rout. Just an absolute disastrous melee between the two sides. Oh, Gustavus Adolphus, he thinks. Oh, God, this is how Gustavus Adolphus died. Mm. Mixed with the enemy, lost in fog. Yeah, I mean, the question now, you've developed this plan, it's fallen apart. The question is, what do you do now? <laughs> uh, this is what it means to be a leader on the battlefield. There are things that are out of your control. Some things are under your control. What do you decide to do? Are you going to lead a charge? Are you going to retreat? Are you going to get yourself out of there? I mean, which option do you take? Suddenly, a man grabs his reins. It's his general. He tells Frederick to flee the field. The battle seems lost, and mm. if he falls, Prussia will too. For True. he has no heir. So Frederick turns his great charger and bolts toward the nearest town. That's true. And he doesn't see that behind him, while his cavalry has broken, the well-drilled Prussian infantry starts to move across the field like solid walls. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Look, I've mentioned this before, but at this time, the Prussian military is one of the best, or maybe the best trained military force in the world. It has a level of discipline, professionalism, and training that is still quite rare. And it's that way because Frederick's father, Frederick William I, had built it up. Throughout his reign, he saved money, he invested in the military, he built up this massive fighting force from a pretty small country, Prussia, with a relatively small population, but a massive, well-trained military. And even with some lackluster leadership from Frederick, uh, you know, give him some slack, he's getting used to this whole military thing. The infantry is doing what they are trained for. Firing in steady volleys, driving off the Austrian cavalry attack. Wow. It is Frederick's first battle, and he's running away. But his <laughs> infantry, the great gift from his father, will yep. stand and fight. Yep. Oh man, Zoe, what a cliffhanger. You know, I don't think I'm going to be able to wait a whole week to... <laughs> what a cliffhanger. And so go and check out their video and their sponsor and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, I thought the first episode was great. We got to see Frederick's childhood. And now we are seeing the beginning of the man who will one day be known as Frederick the Great. His first battle, he's running away. <laughs> Maybe not the fantastic leadership we might think of, but... Everybody's got to start somewhere. And he's already shown that he's pretty capable, intelligent, willing to seize opportunities when they arise. So I really enjoyed this one. I'm very excited to see the rest of the series. I think Frederick is a fascinating character. Um, and I'm enjoying this one. So if you guys are enjoying it as well, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe, comment, and check out the Patreon and channel memberships, both of which can be found down below. Anyway... I hope you guys are all having a great day today, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.